continue to speak about uh, the knowledge of God in this we will be speaking about the knowledge of the nature of God so the natural knowledge of the nature of God in this world as the knowledge of the existence of a thing is not possible without some cognition of its constitution so in the natural knowledge of the existence of God there is always a certain knowledge of his nature every single proof of God reveals a definite perfection of the divine nature the naturally achievable knowledge of God is deepened and extended by a supernatural revelation There is uh, several types of knowing here it looks like we'll be looking at. Two in particular. Yes. Immediate knowledge. Our natural knowledge of God in this world is not an immediate intuitive cognition, but a immediate abstractive knowledge because it is attained through the knowledge of creatures. As we talked about before, there's if we speak in terms of innate knowledge we do so only in as much as we have an innate ability to reason and therefore come to know of god's existence through um, causality um, our knowledge of god is then said to be mediate mediated by things and as we as we discussed earlier uh, it is upon our reflection of things that we come to therefore then reason concerning uh, the existence of God and of his nature in opposition to the teaching of the church uh, ontologism teaches that even in this life we possess from nature an immediate intuitive knowledge of God and that in the light of the immediate knowledge of God we become cognizant of created things the order of knowledge must correspond to the order of being God is the first being must therefore also be the primary object of knowledge however ontologism is incompatible with the doctrine of the General Council of Vienna in 1311 and 12 according to which the soul requires the supernatural light of glory for the immediate knowledge of God in 1861 and 1887 the Holy Office rejected several ontological assertions um, So it is a firm uh, Catholic teaching then that our knowledge of God is not immediate. It is mediated. Right. Holy Scripture proves, on the one hand, that the natural knowledge of God is attained through created things, which uh, we read both in Wisdom 13.1 and um, Romans 1.20. And on the other hand, that no human being is capable of seeing God immediately, but that the vision of God is reserved for the other life. Uh, for example, uh, 1 Timothy 6.16 says, He inhabiteth light inaccessible, whom no one has seen nor can see. And also 1 Corinthians 13.12, Now we see him through a glass in a dark manner, but then face to face in the beatific vision. Then it shall be immediate for now it is mediated it's a strong catholic teaching ontologism also contradicts the testimony of consciousness and in its consequences leads to pantheism and rationalism the ontologists quite wrongly appeal to the teaching of saint augustine of the knowledge Hmm. He doesn't translate the Latin here. Rationibus eternes. Okay. Uh, for St. Augustine, without doubt, teaches a immediate cognition of God, 
which proceeds from the contemplation of the human soul or of the external world in which ascends to God. Okay, fair enough. Our knowledge of God here below is not proper, but it's analogical. Okay, it's uh, analogical cognition, as it means by means of uh, analogy. While cognition, properly so called, comprehends an object through its own mental form or by immediate vision, analogical cognition, of course, uh, comprehends an object through an alien form. In the cognition of God in this world, we apply concepts gained from created things to God on the ground of a certain similarity in ordination of the created things to God, to him, as their efficient and exemplary cause. Uh, that is, that uh, God is the one who uh, created them, makes them what they are, and that uh, God is within himself the perfection of all things, such as beauty and so on and so forth. There is a relation of analogy between the creature and the creator, which is founded on the fact that the creature is necessarily made to the likeness of the creator, this analogy is the basis of all natural knowledge of God. This so-called analogy of being is, uh, sharp, uh, is sharply rejected by Karl Barth as the invention of Antichrist. Uh, despite this analogy or similarity, there is a much greater dissimilarity between the creature and the creator namely the dissimilarity between the finite and the infinite. So there's, there's always that uh, the creator-creature distinction maintained. And it's, it's always, obviously, this, dis this dissimilarity of something that is finite to something that is infinite. So we have to understand uh, that God is dissimilar from things uh, much more uh, than he is in, a, in any way similar and even then only by analogy right here we come to know things um like coming to understand god as father for example uh could be um and having a son these things make sense to us uh, because uh, well we can be fathers and we can be sons in in those relations and so on and so forth uh, so we can use those things by means of analogy but in the case that God is father that is something that we can only know through the revelation of Jesus Christ and so therefore it is not by natural knowledge we come to reason that God is father even if we could reason that it would be fitting for him to be considered such um, but uh, we wouldn't know that he was a father from all eternity even then if the son wasn't revealed to us and that the son was divine as such, reason then enables us to better understand the nature of God through God's revelation, which we spoke earlier about the naturally achievable knowledge of God is deepened and extended by supernatural revelation. Our cognition of God in this world comes as Pseudo-Dionysius, the Aragapic Aero. Pegite, how do you say that? How do you say it? I don't know, I can't read. Taught by the threefold way of affirmation, negation, and eminence. All right, so the way of affirmation or causality proceeds from the consideration that God is the efficient cause of all things and that the efficient cause contains in itself every perfection which is in the effect. So we can reason from that which is from the effect back to the cause in this case. Uh, from this it follows that God, the originator of all creatures, possesses every true perfection of the creatures. The pure perfections are formally ascribed to God. The mixed perfections, which contain something finite in their concept, are ascribed to God in a transferred sense or metaphorically or anthropomorph anthropomorph anthropomorphic. Dang, that's a big word anthropomorphically only all right fine metaphorically um 
also by the way of negation uh, denies to God every imperfection which is found in created things uh, also the the circumscription attached to imperfections of created things deriving from their finiteness All right such negation of an imperfection implies affirmation and eminence for example the infinite uh, is absence of limit it's the fullness of being um, we also see this not just in pseudo Dionysius we actually, we actually see this in Aquinas as well where he talks about um, I think it's in Aquinas I'm sure he reflects upon this as well um, but that we can come to know God through analogy um, in this sense what we affirm that God is like this thing but he's also not like this thing and theology is to be able to describe in what way this thing is like him and in what way is this thing not like him you get that wrong your conception of God is, is all wrong but thankfully um, it's not too difficult to be able to sort that out um, once you start with the idea of proving God's exist, existence through causality that he's a necessary being and therefore what attributes must also what must be true of a necessary being and therefore uh, we can already begin to see philosophically ways in which God is unlike created things so on and so forth uh, under the influence of the theology of the, ne the, the Neoplatonists, certain individual fathers, early church fathers, make use of such formulations as God is not substance, not light, not life, not sense, not spirit, not wisdom, not goodness. They do not wish to deny to God these perfections, but to assert that these perfections do not belong to God in the same manner as they do to creatures, but in an infinitely higher manner. Okay, so in this sense, so let's say a created thing is beautiful. Hey, Alan, welcome in. We'll say that this created thing is beautiful. But we'll also say, well, 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 God is beautiful. But God is beautiful not in the exact same way. All right, we're not speaking uh, univocally here when, when we speak of a beauty of a thing and the beauty of God we're not saying that um, uh, uh, rather we're, we're drawing a distinction that when we speak of the beauty of God it is altogether uh, infinitely higher right, right. so we're, we're, we're using the same term but we're using it by analogy aren't we yes we're saying that the flower is beautiful and appealing to the eye. Um, but in the beatific vision, God will be beautiful. But obviously, beholding God face to face in the beatific vision is not going to be like looking at a flower. All right. Obviously, uh, um, it's we're not asserting that what we're saying about the flower is in any way equivalent to what we will behold in the beatific vision. There's also the way of eminence enables us to deduce from the finite perfections of creatures the, possess the possession by God of infinite analogous perfections. Uh, um, so there's God is like this, there's God isn't like this, and then there's God has the, he is perfectly he contains with himself all perfections which we see to some degree or measure in created things in a finite manner all right so we have affirmation negation and eminence the god is the eminent uh depiction of, of perfections right so we, we can come to reason to god in this manner yeah absolutely alan Catholic apologetics, uh, apologetics. Yes, it's a defense and explanation of the teachings, beliefs, and practices of the Catholic Church. It is to remove objections, shed light on difficult or misunderstood matters, and ultimately help win minds and souls for Jesus Christ. Yeah, very true. Yes.
as, as it is very true. So these three modes of cognition, we can call them modes of cognition, complement one another, obviously, as, as we were talking. All right, they kind of flow into one another in terms of reasoning to God from created things. Uh, for the attributing of a perfection to God demands the attribution of it to him eminently and the negation of every imperfection. We can see how this uh, certainly flows all together. Um, and likewise, God's nature is incomprehensible to men. All right, well, this, this naturally, this logically flows from the fact that we have finite minds and God is an infinite being. God is infinite. Uh, and what he is, he is infinite. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into discussing the, the essence of God in a later lesson. But we don't want... So we, when we speak of God as infinite, he's not infinitely infinite. He's infinite in what he is. All right? So obviously he's not infinitely sin and this that and everything else you know um so we have to we have to understand um that what he is he is infinitely so there isn't anything that he is all of what he is i, I should say so so some people have proposed the idea well okay you have a rival god or something like that well uh, well neither of them would be god then and neither of them would be um which reminds me is a really strange comment uh, in the from the film The Craft. I remember seeing that when I was uh, in high school, where uh, uh, one of the girls was asking the other one who was getting into the witchcraft, and she's like, "Is this is this about God and stuff?" And she's like, "Oh no, this is older than God and the devil." You know, if uh, if if God and the devil were playing a football game, mental would be like the stadium in which they played, you know, which was absolutely ridiculous. Um, oh, yeah, I, I remember seeing it as well. I remember watching it a few times. I had it on VHS tape. Um, but obviously there's a problem in the conception. Number one, Satan is not a rival at all of God. He's not. He's... He's, he's a created being who has lost all, all, all grace except for ceasing to exist. You know, if we, if we, we, we could probably, you know, refer to that as, uh, as some measure of grace. He could slip back into the nothingness from which God brought him about if he didn't hold him into existence. Um, Satan is in no way any kind of rival. And, 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 God, and so... You have to understand that when we speak of God's perfections, we're, we're speaking about that what God is, he is all of what that is. Everywhere, all time, everything. There isn't anything outside of that, because there can be nothing outside of that, that has that as well. All right, so this, this whole idea of, well, why can't there just be another necessary being? Well, because that negates the very definition of being all of what that thing is, you just you just can't do it. Um, oh, where are you copying and pasting this from? This is very formally written, Alan. I, I've I've noticed. I think uh, most of your comments are copy and paste, or you're a genius. So apologetics means, broadly speaking, a form of apology. Yes, so the term is derived from the Latin adjective apologeticus, us, as you know all, yeah, you do, yeah. Yes, you, you, you're mediating the, the internet to us right now. Yes, it doesn't, an apology, yes. So in my title, I say uh, I'm writing an apologetics letter. And I'm going to do it live, which is going to be super boring for, for you guys, I'm sure. Um, and I'll explain more later, though. Yeah. A secret genius trolling us, like... <laughs> yes, absolute genius. Um, uh, to give an apology for the Catholic Church isn't to apologize for 
priests doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, an apology is to give an explanation for the reason, for the hope that is within us, basically. That's that's one of the, the best way of describing it. And not only that, to finish the rest of the verse, but to do so uh, patiently and uh, with charity, uh, which is uh, important. Um, but God's nature is co incomprehensible to men. Now, does that mean we can't know anything about God? We, 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 must, we, we must be careful to say that, that therefore we can't know anything about him. There's many things that we can know about him as one can know and reason to a cause from its effect. Um, that's the natural knowability of God um, in what God reveals to us, like in the incarnation and the, and the, uh, the Trinity and so on and so forth. Um, our revealed doctrines. Um, the philosophers knew nothing of that. The, the, in terms of like, well, claims of incarnation, sure, but uh, that God is a trinity, uh, and, and that requires many, 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 many lessons, which we'll get into. Believe me, we'll get into it, diving into uh, the unity and trinity of God. Uh, we're going to start slow and look at what we can know. Our knowledge of God in this world is a composition of many inadequate concepts, and on account of this composition, it is necessarily limited and imperfect. And by composition is this. So we, finite beings, right, we are by nature composite. We reason compositely. So when we think of things, we, we're drawing distinctions. Like we'll draw a distinction uh, between essence and existence, for instance, because within us, essence and existence are composite. They're two different things. Um, but in God, when we speak of, think of divine simplicity, we are, those things are identical. Okay, uh, God is not a composite. All right. It is God's essence to exist. Right? He, he, by nature, by, uh, by nature exists. Right? So God is simple, but we think in a more composite way. We think we talk of the justice of God. We talk about the, um, the charity of God. And sometimes we have difficulties trying to reconcile those concepts, don't we? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll definitely be uh, going over exactly um, what divine simplicity means in terms of uh, the language of persons. See, the early church fathers used the term person to describe um uh, how God has revealed himself, something that's incommunicable and of a rational nature. So, for example, in God, there is one essence. There is uh, one consciousness, right? There's um, uh, one will, um, one intellect, right? Um, the trinity in this is a mystery, all right. We don't fully comprehend all the things that God has revealed to us concerning his nature. Remember, we're starting with the premise that we are finite and God is infinite. So consider the fact that we could learn about God for all eternity and we'd still never exhaust it. Because only God, who is infinite, can know himself infinitely. If God were to reveal something of himself to us... Um, something of his inner nature, of what, what we come to know of the Logos, for, for example. The, uh, the, the Logos is God because it uh, flows from his intellect, right? So God's intellect, his knowledge of himself is divine. We could speak 
by analogy that the, the, the Logos, that is the image of God, his self-knowledge as a distinction of some sort, but it's still God. So we, 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 can, we can talk in that, that kind of language. And remember, we're, talk, we're not comprehending this fully. We're speaking more by means of analogy, right? Yeah. Um, but I think we could conceptualize as being finite, we could conceptualize the idea of the infinite um, by logical infinite regress. We would do this in mathematics and so on and so forth. Um, but anyways, um, so there is a certain incomprehensibleness to God. Nevertheless, yes, the doctrine of the, the Trinity is a very profound um, doctrine. Um, God becoming incarnate or revealing to us that this is his nature. Um, has given some people um, some difficulty. And that's fair enough. That, you know, that's, I get that. I get that. But I think some of that also flows from a misunderstanding, too. Because we're not talking about three gods. Uh, we're not even talking about three separate, distinct consciousnesses, for instance. Um, so normally when we think of person, or we use this term uh, in Latin persona or in Greek uh, hypothesis, where um often we are thinking of person through the lens of a human person so it would be wrong to think that there are th three distinct consciousnesses within god for instance that, that that would be heresy um so we're not speaking of person in the same way what we're saying that there's something in god that's incommunicable, right? And like I used the analogy of uh, the image of God within his own intellect being God itself, right? Um, there's the, there's, by analogy, there's some measure of distinction that is being made there, but we're also saying it's the same thing, all right? That they share the same nature, um, so. Contradiction, corollary is fair way to reason to the idea infinitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's all... Philosophy is very interesting. There's a lot of rabbit holes to go down, and uh, I'm by no means a, an expert on such things. Um, and in my reflections here live on the spot aren't always flowing from recent study sometimes it these are just my thoughts at the time and i could be slightly wrong in the terminology i'm using or how i'm conceptualizing it um but bothius uh gave us pretty much the most that we can know about what person means Okay, so remember, this is language that we have developed to try to understand the fullness of God's revelation, all right? This term person is, is used. And uh, there, there were three things in how both the communicated. One was of, of a rational nature. Um, so the, the, there's an, the divine intellect is involved in this, um, which is only one, by the way. There's only one divine intellect, not, not multiple. Um, it's incommunicable, meaning that, um, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here because there's a lot of things that I, I, I'm uh, purposing to do tonight. Uh, so it's not fresh on my mind, but it's um, the, the father begets the son. All right? He's eternally generated by an act of intellect, specifically. 
whereas the the, the, the Holy Spirit then is said to uh, spirate from the Father uh, and the Son or through the Son um, um, uh, by an act of divine will and there's only one will that there's a relationship uh, of the the intellectual um, uh, generation of the son and the um, the volitional act of the procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son. Um, there is depth in how we, we, we come to reflect on these things. Um, but in, in a, in, and so like we would say, you know, uh, the Son is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God, uh, but the, the, the Father is not the Son. And, and so instantly that was something that both theists would say, well, it's okay, therefore, what, what we, we say of Father is something that is incommunicable. All right. So, so the Father doesn't communicate that fatherhood to the Son or to the Holy Spirit. There, there's something unique about the Father as the monarchical head uh, in this. Um, I, I don't want to use the words uh, uh, sorb, uh, subordinationist kind of view um, because th th there is a heresy of subordinationism. Uh, where the Son and the Holy Spirit are seen as um, like unequal with the Father and so on and so forth. So I, I want to be careful to uh, use that term without uh, qualification because I don't want to get that wrong. Yeah. Like hearing cultural ideas. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I, I like think I like thinking about stuff. I like thinking about stuff. Uh, that's that's why I come down here and do this. I'm a lay Dominican, so I, I do the, the liturgy of the hours every night and then, you know, reflect on like scripture or theology, stuff like that. So, um, all right, so the, all right, so we said our knowledge of God in this world uh, is a composition of uh, many inadequate concepts. And on account of this, composition is necessarily limited and imperfect. imperfect. The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 and the Vatican Council call God incomprehensible. The, Latin, uh, the Lateran Council also calls him ineffable. Uh, according to the Vulgate, uh, great in council and incomprehensible in thought. Uh, also, there's the passage in Romans 1113 that says how incomprehensible are his judgments and how unsearchable his ways i love the way that paul put that in romans hey retro welcome in good to see you the fathers notably saint basil uh, saint gregory of nyza uh, saint john christostom defend the incomprehensible of the divine essence by indicating the infinity and the sublimity of God in comparison with all creatures against the Eunamians, who assume an exhaustive or an adequate or comprehensive cognition of God, and indeed even in this world. So there is a distinction here in Catholic theology then. Um, the Catholics affirm there are indeed things that we can know about God through natural reason, and there are things we can know about God uh, only by means of his self-disclosure, his revelation. And there's some things we just don't know about God because he hasn't revealed it to us. And even the things that he has revealed to us, we can reason through, certainly. That doesn't mean we fully comprehend all, all of what can possibly be known about it. In fact, what I was talking about um, you know, using the term person and everything concerning the Trinity uh, is pretty much about as far as we can go without then all we have left is just asking, you know, what does it mean for something to be incommunicable? incommunicable or what does it mean for something to be rational? Uh, all we're doing now is just defining the language that we're using to define God and to try to understand the relationship of things, you know. Um, because we're, we're trying to reason 
how uh, it, and this is a very simple philosophical question um, it, uh, we certainly aren't going to deal with it this evening but there's the question of you know if God is unchangeable how can anything ever be created right God would have to at one point not create and at some point create and I'm talking not, I'm not talking in terms of chronology I'm talking about at all but perhaps even the question itself betrays itself because maybe we're already assuming a kind of chronology like before creation eternity passed traversed time right so we're already thinking that there's the, God had to traverse in eternity doing nothing you know before creating something but that would be unfair and so maybe we need to rethink how we ask the question right because our question seems to assume something about the nature of things or about the nature of God and uh, obviously we're, we might just be asking the wrong question right? there's, there's fun things that we can think about for sure um, St. Augustine says uh, more true than our speech about God is our thinking of him and more true than our thinking is his being fair enough he wrote that in his uh, work on the Trinity. Only God possesses a comprehensive knowledge of God. Imagine that. For the infinite being can be completely comprehended by an infinite intellect only. Fair enough. Uh, I think this comes from Aquinas in the, in the Summa, part one. A God whose being is infinite is infinitely knowable. No created understanding can, however, know God in an infinite manner. This makes sense. You praying for your mom in the hospital? Oh, most excellent. Yeah. Most I'm 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 glad to hear that. Um it can always be uh stressful when a a loved one is uh ailing. Yeah. And uh, God is certainly uh, uh, cares for us, and um, sometimes things that are best for us in the long run, in the short run, doesn't always seem so pleasant. But uh, rest assured um, that, that there's a there's a long goal, right? That there's a there's a long plan and, and process. So although our knowledge of God in this world is imperfect, uh, still it is true. Because God really possesses the perfections attributed to him, and because we are conscious of the analogical character of our knowledge of God and our assertions concerning him. So that uh, brings us to uh, the end of that little lesson here. Um, Fascinating stuff. Always interesting to ponder.